Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Ephesians 1, verse 3. I want to bless you with that. I just want to greet you with that and just say once again to this morning, we are blessed to be together. God has granted it to us one more time, and hopefully we will continue to have this blessing. Although we see as the world is turning and the things that are going on in the world, we can see that this is not the case everywhere anymore all the time. This morning... The topic for this morning is called the Jezebel spirit, and I want to say a couple of words. Maybe there's one or two or three, four people here that have heard this message before. It's not the first time that I've presented this message here, and those of you who have heard it, you might think, well, we don't need to hear the same message again, or we don't need his warmed up soup. Well, I used to, I had this serious commitment that I would never share a message more than once in one church until I read a book on, on, for preachers, and that book said that if you had a message and it was only worth Delivering once, it wasn't worth delivering. If it's a good message, it's worth delivering more than once. And on top of that, I know a lot of you listen to more than one message more than once on the YouTube or wherever, so maybe this is okay. I I hope it is. And there are some new things I want to carry into this this morning, so I have the confidence that God's Word will still speak and that it's still a truth even though it has been brought here before. But I also know there are quite a few of you here that have never heard this message before, and so I simply want to bring it before you. I want to tell you just a little bit of history. I didn't do it in the German service because in German service there's a place where you have to cut off and you have to quit and be ready for the next message. And so here I'm going to take, going to take a little bit more time. Um, I can tell you to this day, it's been f- over 15 years when God gave me this message, and I can tell you to this day where I was. I was sitting in the back seat of a Lincoln, just a little bit south of Amarillo, Texas, coming back from from Kansas. My wife was driving and I was sitting in the back seat and I was reading God's word. And when I read uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 20, which is the text verse this morning, this jumped out at me. And I just want to share that with you this morning. Um, I want to first talk to you a little bit about the spirit before I go into the message. And the reason I want to do that is because there was a brother that came into my office some years ago and I knew he had never heard the message that was presented here. And he talked about the Jezebel spirit. And because of that, I went online to see what he was talking about because he said it was everywhere. I looked at that Jezebel spirit, and I did it again yesterday just to, just to make sure that I understood where I was and what was going on. I am not talking, if you go online and you look at the Jezebel spirit, I'm not talking about that same thing. Um, I am not saying that anyone who has any one of these issues or close by that you are that you are possessed by an evil spirit. It's not too long ago, a brother shared here on a Sunday evening in church that, that, and I want to underscore that this morning, that an evil spirit and the Holy Spirit don't live in the same heart. A Christian cannot be possessed of an evil spirit, and this spirit that I'm talking about is an evil spirit. This, this lady that this is referring to and what I want to talk about is very, very evil, and I just want to make sure that you understand that I am not saying that. It does... I do want to say that, that we do find in God's world, we find in God's kingdom, we find the influences from what is going on in the world bleeds into the church many times. It's often a thing, and, when, and we will see these effects in church, and that's what I'm talking about this morning. Um, also, another thing I want to talk about a little bit is a principle, and if there's a picture up on the screen, um, it'll be up there in just a little bit. And what I want to do is, is uh, talk a little bit about that. I think... Uh, uh, this is worth mentioning. Uh, a lot of people who are in the kingdom of God, they would say salvation is the only thing that matters. They would often say things like, if it's not a salvational issue, I don't want to hear about it, I don't want to deal with it. And then you have those that go a little bit further and they say, well, it ne- we need salvation and sanctification. And it's true, both of, we do need both of those. And I would tell you right away that salvation is the most important thing. And sanctification is important too. But then we have also have the moral law, like the Ten Commandments. That's what I'm talking about. The, the moral law, and I think every Christian would say you shouldn't lie, you shouldn't steal, you shouldn't... There's a lot of things in there that, that we don't do. Now, the mistaken, the, the mistaken idea is that we're earning salvation with the moral law. That's not what it's talking about. This is simply talking about a moral code that Christians live by. And then a lot of people would say, okay, I'll go with that. I can go with those three. But I don't, I, don't need the third, I don't need the fourth one. I don't need the ordinances that we find in the New Testament, which are the six. And I want to talk about one of those ordinances this morning. And I want to give you a picture, 
if you're anywhere in what I just said, if you're anywhere in that, I want to give you an example. And we had some farmers. Do I have a farmer in here this morning? Would you raise your hand if we do? We got, got a couple of farmers in here. Okay, let's just say a farmer says the most important thing is the land, right? Well, until you're in West Texas, and then all of a sudden you say, no, the water is the most important thing. So I'm not sure. We'll just stay with the land just for, for teaching purposes. So a farmer says, all I need is the land. Then he gets the land, and then he realizes he needs water. Oh, and now we have two. And he wouldn't argue with you. He would say, yeah, I need both. And then he would say, now I've got the two most important things. That's it. Is that where we would stop? Or would he say, no, I'm going to need the seed too. Oh, now we've got those three. Now, that's all, those are the three most important things. I don't need anything else. That's all I need. Oh, wait a minute. I need some equipment to, put this, to get the ground ready and to put the seed in the ground. So do we see that we need the whole thing? Now, when we start doing that kind of, where we start saying it's not a salvational issue, and if it's not a salvational issue, I don't want to hear about it. I don't want to be bothered about it. Well, if we're children of God and we're growing up, then we understand as ch children of God that we're growing up that we need more than that. If we're serious about following the Lord, if we're serious about our walk with Christ, then we're going to realize there is more to it than when he just saved me. Now, that's very important. It's, it is a message we hear again and again, and it is very important that we do that. Now, I want to tell you right away that uh, the, um, Brother Henry, when he did the opening, he has a different character, character than I do. He has a more gentle character than I do, and, and I pray that my character doesn't take away from this message. And what I mean by that is I, I know I, I can listen to myself, and uh, uh, like Henry said in the opening, you can try to change yourself all you want, but I can, I'll tell you that when you're in your 50s and all of a sudden you'll realize some things are just about impossible to change. So I've tried to change this character about myself, and one day I just realized that's just who I am. Uh, try to be as gentle as you can, but I hope and pray that the messenger will not subtract from the message. It doesn't change the message just because the messenger is um, de ask me gay and on. So may God grant that it would not be. So I want to talk a little bit about the Jezebel spirit before I go any further. And I want to tell you that the characteristics of, of the Jezebel spirit and rebellion, they, I'm not sure if they're two different spirits that work together and very much look like each other, but they have a lot in common. There's no question about it. If you when a full-blown Jezebel spirit is somewhere, that Jezebel spirit has all the characteristics of rebellion attached to it. And maybe you're wondering what rebellion is. I think rebellion is a, is a good way to, to explain what it is um, just so we understand what's going, what's going on. My definition is of rebellion. Oh, wait. There's two different kinds of rebellion. One of them, if you're going to go on Google and check out the definition of rebellion, you're going to find that it's, a, that it's a group or people who go against the government. That's not what I'm talking about, although, although that same spirit, I mean, it, it looks the same. Spiritual rebellion is simply this. It is going against authority. That is what rebellion is. It's not, uh, oftentimes we think it's all kinds of complicated things, and it's very simple. If you can't stand authority, and, and you can ask yourself this question, and the way I have learned to identify rebellion, if you have, for example, if you have a church leader and there are people that just cannot stand him because he's got this and this and this wrong, and then they replace him because he was so bad, and then it doesn't take very long, and then they have the same thing against that same man who's the different man. That is a clear sign that it's rebellion that is functioning there, and that's simply um, going against authority. And just so you understand uh, what we're looking at and what we're talking about here, and so I'm talking about the Jezebel spirit, and it's very, very much like the spirit of rebellion. And if you haven't seen it, the spirit of rebellion is rampant in this country, not just in this country, but all across the West and even in some of the Southern uh, Hemisphere uh, as well. With that said, I now want to uh, take a little bit of time um, to, to just... Uh, Bring up, we have a practice in the church and a teaching that this is attached to, and I want to go there. For, the first thing I want to do with you is go to Revelation chapter 2 and verse 20. And I know you have that verse in the bulletin there, but I still want to go to Revelation chapter, three, chapter 2, verse 20, and to just simply bring out this truth um, about what we're looking at. The Jezebel spirit, the thought comes out of, and I told you earlier that I was south of Amarillo on the highway, and this verse is what I was reading. And I stopped when I read the verse, and I stopped, and I reread it several times. 
It says in chapter 3, verse 20, it says, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. And so let's back up a little bit just to lay some groundwork here. So the angel said to the church of Thyatira that these things, the son says the son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I know your works. Now look at this. This church had good stuff. It, had, it says, I know your works. And your love and your service and your faith and your patience. As for your works, the last are more than the first. In other words, the church was excelling. And then he says, but I have something against you. It says in verse 20, it says, nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow. And I want you to put a little emphasis on that word allow. Um, allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my spirits to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. So we see um, that there's a, a spirit here, and I want to I just right away bring it up here. Um, does anybody here think that this is one woman in a church? Maybe it was. We don't know. The Bible doesn't say. But what we do know is that there's a specific spirit in here, and we have, we have in this country, and it's not just in this country, it's in the European whatever's considered the West, we have a teaching, and that teaching, or, or an ideology, it's a little bit different. An ideology is a worldly term for pretty much the same thing as Christians do. An ideology is a, uh, the definition for an ideology is this. It says, a system of ideas and I ideals, one which forms the basis of economic or political theory and policy. I want to tie those two together, theory and policy. It is their way of thinking and what they're practicing. The same thing as Christians do. We teach and practice. It are, they're one and the same thing. And we have one in this country that is called feminism. It, feminism didn't start here in America. Feminism started in France in 1837. But US, it didn't hit the U.S. shores until 1908. And I want to tell you why it started. And it was started for a reason that was wrong on the receiving end. There was a lady who was married to a wealthy landowner. That wealthy landowner, when he died, the widow could not put that name, the land in her name because she was a woman. And that sparked um, a movement in her, that sparked a, a, a drive in her, and she started forcing the way, they started marching, they started forcing their way to get two things. They wanted the right to vote, if you don't know this, the original American laws said unless you were a white landowner, you could not vote. In other words, if you were a black man or a woman, you couldn't vote. And they changed all that in the, in the 60s. They, they already started with the women earlier, but feminism, that is the original goal and intent of feminism. And it has morphed into something very, very different. It has become something totally different than that. But that is, that is the definition of, of feminism. And in the Bible, when we're looking at this, and one of the things that I want to say to you is that, that the enemy is very, very good at taking an old thing that didn't work anymore, like the Jezebel spirit, and repackages it and sells it again. It's the same old thing. It's just repackaged and sold as something else. And this time, it is sold as feminism, and it is the Jezebel spirit. Now, the Jezebel spirit is, um, and, and I'm so thankful for this, like, if you look at this and you wonder, is there just one woman that was like this? Is this what God was doing? Well, I, I believe that the scripture gives us things that we can go back to so that we know what we're studying, what we are needing to look at. So if you go back to the previous church, Pergamos, um, in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 14, and I'm going to do the same thing again. I'm going to start off at the beginning and just talk a little bit about the church just so we can get a little bit familiar with that church. In verse 12, it says, And to the angel of the church of Pergamos write, These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know your works. Here again, we see it. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan, Satan's throne is. And what's that? Do you think Satan sets up a throne everywhere? Satan sets up a throne where he's going to have the greatest battle. So this was a place where Satan was really interested in destroying. And it says, And you hold fast my name and do not deny my faith, even in the days which Antipas was my faithful martyr who was killed among you where Satan dwells. And I, uh, I want to propose to you that if you are an Antipas, Satan will come against you. And what was he? 
If you, could, if you read the history books, you'll find he was a man that was serious about his walk with the Lord. He spent as much time on his knees as he did standing up. These are the kinds of people that Satan works against because he knows he will destroy. But that's not the point this morning. The point this morning is he goes into verse 14 and says, I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam and Balak. Were there guys here that were by the name of Balaam and Balak? I propose to you that there weren't. I propose to you that there was the teaching and the practice of Balaam and Balak. And what was that teaching and practice? What Balaam did was he sold Israel, so it has to do with money. And the second one was using immorality to get that. So we see that spirit, that there was a spirit, the spirit of, of finances and, and just doing whatever we have to do to get the money, along with immorality. So we have that same spirit. And that helps us to understand over here when we're looking at Jezebel, and when I call her the Jezebel spirit, when I'm talking about that, that you can add rebellion in there because they look so much alike. And so we have all these spiritual pictures here that we can learn a lot from. So in order to better understand Jezebel, let's go to 1 Kings and let's learn what Jezebel was. I want to tell you, I'm focusing quite a bit on this, this idea or this word that's in Revelation chapter 2, verse 20, it says that they allow, and that's the, the emphasis that I want to keep coming back to, and I'm going to talk about, about something here that brings that out. I want to demonstrate to you that King Ahab was the king, and kings were not like elected presidents. They were not beholden to the people. They made the rules, and they ran with that and did whatever they wanted to. So we have a king who is in complete authority, and we have the king's wife, and apparently, he is allowing her to share some of that authority. And that's where I want to go. And that's, that's the picture I want to bring over into Revelation chapter 2, verse 20, where, he's, where the church is allowing. I want to put some emphasis on that because it's, it's important. So in, in 1 Kings chapter 16, in verse 30 through 33, I'm just going to quickly read them. For the sake of time, I'm not going to go through all of these real seriously just so that you can get that picture. And it says, and I want to bring out, the very first thing I want to bring out is, um, if you uh, have married kids, then maybe your in-laws aren't too good, right? You know, if there's any kind of marriage problems anywhere, it's always the in-laws, right? Well, I want to tell you this morning that, that whoever you are, whatever you pick is a pretty good indicator that you're picking somebody that suits you. So we'll see later that Jezebel really provoked Ahab. But you've got to know that Ahab was evil to begin with, or else he wouldn't have picked a Jezebel. That's the point I wanted to make in this. 16, and verse 30, says, Now Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord. That's the first thing I wanted to pick up. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. It wasn't Jezebel that was, that was provoking him. He did evil. And it says, More than all who were before him. And it came to pass as though it had been a trivial thing. Brothers and sisters, listen real, clear, listen real clearly. If there is any sin in your life, and you're starting to make that sin trivial, it's one thing to not get victory, as we saw, heard in the opening, but it's another thing to start considering a sin a trivial matter. A sin is no trivial matter, and for the good English can trivial might and clean it dink. Trivial is something little. So he considered the sins... Um, to be trivial for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam. And there's another one. Brothers and sisters, especially those that are married and have children, we are leaving a legacy behind. Our children will be affected by the way we live and the th decisions we make. So let's make the decisions for the Lord. And then it says that he took a wife, that he took as wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethabal, king of the Sidonites, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. Then he set up an altar for, for Baal in the temple of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. If you don't know where Samaria is and what Samaria is, it's, uh, it's north of Jerusalem and, and to, the east a little way, uh, to the west a little ways. And the thing I want to really pick up there is that this was a mixed race of people. It was Jews mixed with some, some uh, non-Jewish people that were, that were uh, married and it just became a whole city there. And the Jews were despised these people. And then it says, and Ahab made a woman, wooden image. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord. And this is where I really wanted to go. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord 
God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. So he was evil in his own right. He was, he was evil on his own without Jezebel. And now I want to go to chapter 22 and show you that these kinds of people support each other. And then I want to apply this just lightly here. And that is this. That is that spouses, husbands and wives, when your husband, when your wife does the good and right thing, support them, encourage them. When they do the wrong, do not be afraid to tell them that they are out of line. This has to be a part of your relationship if you want to come forward. And these two did that. Listen to this. But there was no one like Ahab who sold himself to the wickedness, to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord because Jezebel, Jezebel his wife, stirred him up. She was, she was provoking him to get even eviler, to even more evil. And she just, she did, she continued to do this. So the story of Ahab and Jezebel is a very interesting story, and we're not going to go to all of those things, but I just wanted to lift a few things up so that we understand when in Revelation chapter 2, verse 20, and it talks about Jezebel, it is no little matter. It is a serious matter, and yet it was still a church, and we have to remember that. So let's take this further. Let's take some things out of here. Um, and we want to continue with this idea that, that Ahab... Uh, had given authority over, and I want to, before I do, I want to prove yet that Ahab wasn't always completely evil. I'm not going to go to any scripture references, I'm just going to mention a few things here. Ahab had a son, and his name was Ahaziah, which means Yahweh has grasp, or, or maybe this way. Yahweh, and Yahweh is the Old Testament Hebrew term for God. So God had touched him or had gotten a hold of him. So Ahab wasn't always totally sold out to do evil. He was, at one point, you see from this, that he was, was with God. And then you go a little bit further, and you find Joram, also his son, and his name means Yahweh is exalted. That means God is lifted up. So we see from that that he wasn't always evil, but we know that he was very evil later. Now I want to go back to showing and I don't know if I'll show you all three of them, but I will mention them at the end. I want to show you that Ahab took up leadership three times. Clearly that we see that he was being the leader that he was supposed to be. And then I will show you three times um, that Jezebel took up authority. The first time is in Acts chapter 18, in verse 4. And here we're going to prove one time that Jezebel had authority in her hands. And... 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 4, it says, For so it was while Jezebel massacred the prophets. Now, the second in command in the United States is also guilty of the same sin, except she's not guilty of massacring prophets. She's guilty of being part of the whole machine of massacring babies, unborn babies. Our second in command, there was a man that proved in California that they were selling baby parts. And they put the man in jail instead of the people who were selling baby parts. And she was at the head of that. She was the, the attorney in charge of that whole thing. We have some of these women in our country right now. So here it says, for, so it was while Jezebel massacred the prophets. So we see she had authority. You cannot massacre a whole group of, of people, the prophets, and not have some sort of authority in your hands. And then it says that Obadiah had taken, and here we see a little bit of Hope, as we always do. I see hope in our country, and I see hope in, in churches. Always it's there. If you look for it, there's always hope that things can get better. And here it was too. 100 prophets and hid them, 50 to a cave, and he fed them with bread and water. She had authority to do things. In verse 13, it says, Was it not reported to my Lord that when I, that, that excuse me, what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord, how I hid 100 men of the Lord's prophets, 50 to a cave, and fed them bread and water. So there's a, there's a prophet here that was in, the ch in charge. He was, he was part of the whole machine. He was able to do some good things. But what we see here, what I wanted to lift up here, is that she had authority and she was using that authority. We don't know if it was given to her or if she took it, but we know she had it. Um, in chapter 20, we also see Ahab taking up leadership. And I would encourage you to go home and read these chapters uh, Ahab was actually listening to prophets when it came to war. He was actually following through with what he was supposed to do. And let's see here. 
So we, if you read that chapter, I'm not going to read that to you, but that's one of the places that he, that's the second place that he takes, takes up authority. The first one, leadership, was in the naming of his boys, and this is the second time. And now we want to see how Ahab, the spirit that he had about him, uh, the things that they were doing. And we'll also see this in uh, how, this, uh, how this is going on today as well. So n- another story here to show uh, the kind of person that Ahab was. Ahab uh, had a vineyard. He had a very good vineyard. And he wanted another man's vineyard, Nabath. He wanted his vineyard. And he offered to trade and says, my vineyard is better than yours. And this, this Abath, Nabath says, no, no, this is an, this is an inheritance. This is, this is my heritage. It's not for sale. I'm not trading it. It's mine. I could not do that. I could not, uh, I could not be evil by getting rid of my inheritance. And then he offers him money, and he says, still says, no, I'm not doing that. So then Ahab does what? Ahab does, he, he behaves very childly. Look, look at what it says in verse 43. It says, so the king of Israel went to his house sullen and displeased and came to Samaria. Oh, my goodness. This is a grown king. You know what, uh, you know what sullen means, right? I'm going to read the definition first out of the Webster. It means showing resentment, ill humor, by, by morse, uh, unsociable, withdrawal, gloomy, and sad. So then if you go to the next chapter, then Jezebel comes to Ahab and says, what's wrong? I'm being a little humorous here. I mean, can you imagine this? A king and his wife and, and the, the queen, and she's like, what's wrong? Why are you so sullen? Was it a in action? Th- that's basically what's going on here. And he's like, well, Naboth won't sell me the vineyard. I, I'm, I'm mocking now, I know. But that's basically what was going on here. So these grown adults who are supposed to be in charge, these are the spirits that we see that go with that. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Do you see people doing this today as well? Grown people who shouldn't be doing that? There are grown people that do this today. Just so you know that, the, the, that there's nothing really new under the sun. It's all, it's all been there before. So we see this, and then she takes up leadership here. She takes up leadership by writing a letter to another town where this, where this Nabath lived, and he, he, she writes all kinds of lies in this letter, and Nabath is killed, and then he gets his vineyard. And I want to insert something here. Christians are lied about all the time, and their lives are destroyed because of lies. That's what happened here. It's nothing new either. Christians will be treated that way. So we see uh, leadership taken up from from, uh, uh, Jezebel once again. I had the privilege of being in uh, Israel on Mount Carmel where uh, Elijah was, where where Elijah had that, that great showdown with the prophets of Baal. And in, in this story, that same story, after Elijah does this great thing, I mean, God comes down in a mighty way just to show to you that us Christians, we have problems too. Well, whether, a, whether Jezebel had the authority or not, she told the man to tell, a, to tell Elijah that I'm going to come after you. I'm going to kill you. And what, is, what did he just experience? He experienced God coming down and sapping up the water that was there, and he, and he burned all of it, just like that. He saw all this, and then he killed 400 prophets. And here's this little woman that says, I'm going to kill you, and he runs away. He runs off into the wilderness. And and I want to propose to you that that, I believe that this is where Christians often are. This is when we're tired and worn out. This is what we do. But God took care of him. But what I want to tell you is that she took authority again. She took the authority to say, I'm going to kill you, and he ran away. So three times we see uh, each of them taking up leadership. Uh, Ahab, he took up leadership in, in naming his sons, going to war, and in finding Elijah. The third, and, and in her case, she took up leadership three times, once in killing of the prophets, once in the whole killing, getting Naboth killed, and the third time in ordering Elijah be killed. Of course, she didn't get that done. Our text verse says that, that he, what he has against the church is not just the Jezebel spirit, but that they allow the Jezebel spirit. And I I think that's a a little thing there that's a warning to church leadership and to church brothers, especially in a brotherhood church, that we watch these things. 
I hope you're okay if it goes over time a little bit because I really need to finish this. I want to look over here a little bit. Women, um, all of these guys on this side, if somebody breaks their door down and says, I'm going to come in and I'm going to hurt your family, you're going to see them stand up to the fight, even when they don't want to. Even if they consider themselves non-resistance, that, that inner man will stand up. But you know what your man can't stand? You know what he will succumb to? Proverbs 19.13 says that a quarrelsome wife is as a dripping faucet. That's something that a man can't stand. He don't know what to do with when that faucet drips and drips and drips. He comes in. She says, I already told you for the thousandth time I want that faucet fixed. I'm telling you for the thousandth time I need a new car. Lisa down the road has got a new car, and I want a new car too. He can handle just about anything. How come you can't be as spiritual as old John is down the street? Oh, my goodness, you want to drive him out the house? Go ahead and do that. And another one that says in Proverbs 21, 9 says, better on the corner of a housetop uh, than to be inside the house with a quarrelsome woman. Men, you have to learn to deal with this, right? I don't, I don't really know what to tell you what to do except find a way. Um, we're not all the same. Uh, there's a lot of things that you could say about people, but you couldn't accuse my wife of being a nagger. That's one thing, one thing she doesn't do. She learned that as a child that she doesn't ag agree with. She doesn't practice that. But back to the seriousness of the matter here. Um, so what, what I want to tell you men, um, uh, women and men, is men will rise to the occasion and men can stand up and stand up and be leaders, except for in this way that I told you. That's a, one of the weak areas of men that they can't handle when it's that dripping. When it's something big, They'll, they'll stand up to it. But if it's something like that, they generally have a weakness with that. Now, um, a little thought here that, that I, I don't know. Some of you are going to say, no, I don't agree with that. But that's okay. This is how it was taught to me, and I still see it in the scriptures. I'm going to continue to teach it like that. How do you tie the old and the new together? What do you keep from the old, and what don't you keep from the old? The way it was taught to me, and I see it in the scripture to this day, if the new doesn't nullify, in other words, if the new doesn't take it away, then the old stands. Some of the things Jesus directly changed. For example, in the Old Testament it was taught, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, and Jesus says, but I tell you nay, turn the other cheek. That's something that Jesus directly changed. The one I want to take you to now is, is, is one of those teachings that is supported in the New Testament. It's 1 Corinthians 11. It is supported in the New Testament from the Old, Old Testament teaching. You see here clearly the whole, the whole authority chain and that God doesn't want the women to have a authority. And now it has nothing to do, please don't misunderstand me, it has nothing to do with God valuing women less than men. It has nothing to do with that. And men are not of greater value because they have a greater role in leadership. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about being in our proper place, in our proper role. That's what God wants. And we see... In this teaching here, in 1 Corinthians 11, uh, too many times people make it about a, a veiling. They make it about a cloth on the woman's head. It is much more than that. That is definitely there. And I want to I wanna lift it up among the sisters that God has blessed you to do this. God wants you to do this. And I want to lift it up and say, keep on doing it. Don't back off. Here, I want to... Um, ladies, if you're on the street in town somewhere... And an unbeliever or someone that comes from a church that doesn't practice this ask you, why do you wear it? Can you answer that? I want to give you something so simple this morning, and I hope you can't, you can't even forget it, even if you want. If you look at, chapter, at verse 3, it says, But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. All right, now let's do this really simple. Somebody says, why do you wear the covering? Your answer should be, because I believe in the proper chain of authority. And that proper chain of authority is that woman is under, is under the authority of a man. Man is under the authority of Christ. And Christ is under the authority of God. That's what this teaches. And then if you go to verse 10, it says, And for this reason, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head. That's that simple. We complicate this so many times. And it's not complicated. It's very simple. God wanted his children to tell the world that we believe in this chain of authority. And this is what we see in, in Revelation chapter 22, verse 20. We see it very clearly 
that someone that wasn't supposed to be in leadership was taking up leadership. Now, I want to tell you um, something that needs to be said here, too. In our community, uh, as I was growing up, I heard that if a woman doesn't wear a covering when she's praying, then her prayers won't be heard. Now, I want to grant you right away that if a woman is not wearing the, head, the covering out of rebellion, then her, and we'll go to Revelation chapter 2 and verse 23 later, or we'll, I'll just mention it to you because I'm running out of time. There it says very clearly that God is interested in the heart, and it's all through the scripture. So a rebellious heart, it wouldn't be heard because of not wearing the covering, but because it's a rebellious heart. So it doesn't say anywhere, and I want to make sure that we understand that. And if we try to undergird something by, by adding unbiblical things to it, then we're actually subtracting it. It does not say that a woman's prayers won't be heard. Let's, be sure on, let's make sure on that. But it does say in verse 5, But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, for that is one and the same as if she were shorn. So we see this, this clear teaching that it's, a, it's, it's something that God wants us to do. We should be distinct. We should be a peculiar people. And I find, and that is also what we find in Revelation chapter 2, verse 20 in that church, is there was a spirit of worldliness that had crept into that church. And I want to make sure that we understand that we are no different. The spirit of worldliness, worldliness, I can't even say it this morning. Um, the spirit, spirit of worldliness is creeping into the church in a lot of places, and we need to be careful that we continue to work on that. Originally, feminism if they had known it, was, it didn't affect the church at all, if they had, and, if, and if they had known where they were going with that, I don't believe that they would have done what they did. There are always unintended consequences, and that's the way it is with this as well. And today, um, it's called feminism. It's been repackaged. It's that same old uh, teaching that, that was way back, the practice that was way back in there already, and we need to make sure that we're not there. And I want to spend a little bit of time with you guys over here. I'm kind of looking around to see if anybody has this before I say it, right? No, no, I'm going to say it anyway. There's another teaching that goes with this, and I'm not going to turn there, but I'm going to share it with you, and it's Deuteronomy 22, verse 5. It says that it is detestable to God when a, man wears, when a woman wears manly clothing, and I don't see us having an issue with that. And then it says, but it's also detestable for a man to wear clothing that pertains to a man, I mean to a woman. And you might say, well, nobody around here does that. Well, not full-fledged, not like, uh, like when you see a couple of homosexuals or lesbians. If you see them together, if you see the man, he'll, the, the one that plays the dominant role, he'll be dressed like a regular man. But the one that plays the, the submissive role will be dressed like a woman. You've got soft little shirts and soft little pants and walks like, like trying to walk like a girl. That's detestable to God, to God I promise you. That, that is a, that's a groil to God. So the, the thing I want to challenge you with, when you go to the, to the store to buy your shirts, when you put it on, you look in the mirror and see if you look masculine or feminine. I see a little bit of this. Not necessarily much in our church, but I see it a little bit here and there. But I have been to churches where a young man got up behind the pulpit. He was wearing one of those nice little straight shirts and, and uh, even walked a little bit like that. And you think, and I was like, what's wrong with this guy? Like the, I, was in a, I was in Mexico of all places in the world. And I was like, no, nah, they only have men down here. They don't have this. But all of this that I'm talking about, it all fits in together. When you, have, when you have all of this going on, and this feminism that's called feminism, I think there's actually a different term that, that it needs to be labeled with. Feminism is, is, you know what feminism is, right? A woman that's very feminine, right? And what's a feminine woman? She's got soft cheeks, and, and she's a soft, gentle soul, and, right? That's what feminism is, right? That's a feminine woman, right? They dress things, things that look dainty, right? You get that over here, it's nasty. That belongs over here, not over here. But I don't think we should call it feminism. It should be called gender neutralizing. What it has done is it has made, um, there's not a clear distinction between the males, and then we wonder why there's so much of this going on. Now today, it's, it's, I think it's straight up, I think it's evil, but today, our government is talking about financing when, a, when one of these kids decides that, oh, I'm born in the wrong gender, I'm going to be the other. We're going to pay for the chemicals to keep that boy from developing to be a boy and that girl from developing to be a girl. She's going to become masculine. This is, 
This is what it's called. So it's not really called, it shouldn't be called feminism. It should be called uh, the masculining of, of men, maybe. You see a lot of that. Or it should be called the gender neutralizing, because that is, in effect, what has happened, and that's where we're at. I want to add a couple more things to this. Uh, and this comes from, from having the, the privilege, or whatever you want to call it, of living longer. And I'm by no means old, but I'm quite a bit older than especially those in the front here. But I want to lift up something else that I believe is well worth our attention. When I was a young man, and when I was a boy, like these boys, uh, it was pretty typical for, boys to be, for men to be wearing, one, a wedding band, and maybe a second, wedding, a second ring maybe on the other finger. But that's about the extent of the jewelry you saw on men. And then the early 90s, I remember clearly, I worked at, the, at a tractor house. If you don't know what that's, an old term for a place where they sell tractors and fix them and all things tractors. And I worked at one of these places, and I was carrying something out for a customer. And when I turned around and looked up at the guy, he had a couple of studs in his ears. I want to tell you honestly, I was, I was shocked. That was so straight up weird to me that a man would have his ears pierced and would have, be wearing earrings. Later on, someone asked me years later, um, how come the Bible only tells the women not to wear jewelry and not the men? Is it okay for men to wear jewelry? I'll tell you why I believe it is. If I leave the house, and I have a teenage boy in the house, and I have my pickup pulled in the garage and I have the door closed, and I tell my son before I leave, you are not to open that garage door. You're not even to go inside the garage. You're to stay outside. You're not to go in there. If I were to come home and find that he had driven the pickup and the doors were closed, could I not clearly tell that he had not listened? Would, would it not be an assumption that he's not to drive the pickup? I believe the assumption we can make that the scripture doesn't say why men aren't to wear it because it's already so far out of line, the men are feminine when they start wearing jewelry. That is, that is feminine. That is why God says for the women not to wear it, because it is a feminine thing. That's where the problem is going to be. I hope that you see from 1 Corinthians 11 very clearly that there's more in there. And I shared this at the previous, uh, previous message already. And there's definitely more in this chapter. I'm just barely touching it a little bit. But I do want to bring it out that it, it brings across that Old Testament teaching that there should be a clear masculine group of people, and there should be a clear feminine group of people, and we as a society, we as a, a church, we are going to be the salt in the society, and we're going to stick out. I know that. And I know that's not always fun, and men, you can help your women to do this. You can, you can not be ashamed. I know there are men who are then ashamed of their wives, but I want to just encourage you, don't do that. What is the cure for all of this? What is the antibiotic to all of this? Number one is that we, I want to just continue to preach that, that God's children, that we're only God's child through the rebirth. We are not by practicing uh, a certain set of rules and a certain set of things, that doesn't make us Christian. But as God's children, the way this is solved is by the men taking up the spiritual leadership in your home. There are women that tell their pastors all the time, I want to have a devotion at the house, but my husband doesn't want to have devotions. And then she says, is it okay for me to have devotions with my children? It's not her role. It's your role. And because men are not taking their spiritual leadership roles seriously, there's a lot of places where women will say, because my husband doesn't, I do. I don't know what the answer is to that. I have told women, you can't do it even then because it is your husband's responsibility and if you're filling someone else's role, that doesn't make it right, doesn't make it correct. So the answer is, and men, I want to also say this, that we are to be the spiritual leaders in the home. That means we don't lord it over, over our women. First, uh, First Peter 5, 3 and, and 3, 7 both teach us that very clearly that we're not to lord it over our women. That's not what this is about. And women, I sure hope you understand that that's not what this is about. The Christian man has done more for the woman than any other society, any other time. Women were all, all suppressed until the Christian men started giving them liberties because of what we see in the scriptures. 
but we don't then reverse that and usurp that authority and rule, rule it over, our, uh, over the men all of a sudden. So the antidote is for the women to submit and for the men to take up leadership the way they should. May God bless his word. Let's stand for prayer.